Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like Kimuraware from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode 161 of the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today Frank Shamra, former UFC champ. Great conversation. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy. We are live. We are live on the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today Frank Shamrock. What is up, brother? Yeah, just living the dream, man. This is, uh, is going to be a fun conversation because there's so many layers I want to get to. Let's Let's start off this conversation where one thing you just said right now, we're going to get to talk about you growing up and all that stuff like that, but you're managing right now. So what, what part of the business, what are you doing with that? We were, prior to going live, uh, Frank was just talking, he was in Pomona and, and he was talking about um, being with one of his clients. So I thought he was recording for himself, but he was with his client. What are you doing right now with that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, when I was a fighter, I had a um, ton of fighters. And so I, you know, was looking after them both as a trainer and a coach. And then, um, and then I, I, you know, I realized there was a lack of management. So I started managing fighters. And then, um, when I launched my own league, I launched uh, strike force with my partner, Scott Coker. Um, yeah. you know, I, I started, well, I started to feel conflicted because I was the league owner and the manager and the trainer. And, uh, it didn't seem all that, you know, straight and narrow. So I stopped managing fighters mm-hmm. and I started to shut down that business and, at the exact same time, I was invited to be a sports broadcaster for Showtime, Showtime Networks. Yeah. yeah. And um, and so I'd close the business. Uh, I start becoming a sports broadcaster. And I meet Mauro Ranallo, who's, you know, the voice of combat sports. Uh, he was our yeah. lead play, play-by-play guy. Can- Canadian um, boy. Canadian boy. Yeah, he's yeah. from Abbotsford, yeah. BC. So yeah. I, uh, you know, he we become friends. And he really helped me out, you know, in a key time. It's actually my first time broadcasting. And he noticed how nervous I was. And uh, he turns to me and says, you know, what's wrong? And I says, I'm really nervous. You know, I, didn't, I don't watch sports. I don't know broadcasting. I, don't, I have no idea what's happening here. And unlike every other broadcaster in the business, he stops the entire production and teaches me for five minutes the fundamentals of broadcasting. <laughs> and awesome. it made such an impression on me that I just looked to return the favor. And, you know, as I started talking to him and we started building our friendship, I noticed he needed help, like with his business and managing things. And so I slowly started helping him. And then um, I never closed that management business because he became my first client that wasn't a fighter. And I've been managing him ever since. It's been 12 years now. Uh, so, so, me, so, so you're with him through that documentary that he oh, recorded? Yeah, the, uh, I'm the executive producer of the I had documentary. No clue. And I forced him to make the documentary. That was because, very that was very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Well, I so it, the backstory is I never knew he was bipolar. It yeah. took about 5 or 6 years to figure it out. And and then when he did, I started learning about it. You know, my my older brother was also bipolar. And so he was a homeless veteran at the time and I was trying to figure out, you know, how to help him. And so I started learning all about bipolar. And, and while I couldn't help my brother, that knowledge was so helpful to Moro. Yeah. So that film was um, a push for Moro to become a social activist. Because he always talked about, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to help people with my message. And I was like, bro, until you get on stage, you're not going to help anybody. Yeah, you know, until, 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 you, you, until you tell your story. Until you do this and you go, you know, you show what's really going on we can't help people. So that's how the film started. And, you know, he's been now become my best friend. Seriously, um, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I manage his whole career and business and, and everything. Uh, I, but he I, got to, I had, I had no idea first off that you do that, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. Which is pretty amazing. And, and I yeah. didn't, I didn't, I, I knew you, you two had a connection. I wasn't aware it was that close and that networked. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a great guy, you know, just a, genuine talent and a real nice guy and just um, I've never met somebody so talented 
in that field. Yeah. And, you know, my, and he told me is, you know, told me what he wants to do. I want to, you know, want to be a game show host. I want to do all these different things. And I always saw him with that talent, but, you know, he's kind of locked into this broadcast world. So for the past, I'd say three to five years, we've been pushing him into other areas. The film was a big step. Um, you know, he's auditioned for. Big, big. And, um, you know, he did the audition and crushed it. And then, you know, the next thing was, oh, by the way, it's, you know, a month in the remote jungles of Panama. And, um, you know, it's a really tough production. So, so, so he's uh, in this, he's in this. Yeah. Yeah. He's the oh. host. Yeah. You're when you, when it comes out, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's going to be massive. Absolutely massive. So are you guys try? do you guys have a deal already? Or are you guys trying to, are you trying to shop it off after? Oh no, no. We shot an entire season for CBS. Look yeah, at yeah. you guys, huh? Oh, Beautiful. you'll see it. It's going to be, it's going to be a game changer for Moro and then for mental health, because you know, what, what the film did for Moro was, was he, you know, he embraced it. And then people saw what it, what it really was like to be bipolar. And then my, you know, I'm proudest of the film because, you know, not only did I help my buddy take that position, but when you watch the film, you know, you learn about what it really is truly about. And then you learn about the care. And yeah. then you learn about what to do when you have somebody, you know, that you love or a family member. It's, hard, so, it's very, very hard to, to see. Right? It's super challenging because, yeah. you know, nobody wants to talk about, you know, severe mental illness and nobody no. wants to. I mean, it's, it's, a, like, it's a lot more in the light now than it was years back. But I mean, it's still yeah. it's still a very taboo kind of topic. Right. Yeah, it just doesn't. We we haven't gotten there yet in society. We're moving very quickly. And, and you know, Morris film, the bipolar rock and roller was a huge you know, yeah. step in that direction, open the door. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, so since then he's just, you know, skyrocketed in both his brand and his career. Um, and then I also think, you know, well, it was a lot easier for me. I'm, you know, I've been shuffling cards and <laughs> trying to explain to people what's going on with him because it's, it's, it's unimaginable unless you experience it. And what we showed in the film was, Hey, you know, it's, it's it's a it's a gift it's a curse it's an ailment it's just you gotta you gotta learn how to deal with it you gotta get the right tools and you know for for him it's really about self-care you know people with severe mental illness die 18 to 20 years before everybody else because they don't have enough self-care because they're you know their minds are elsewhere so you know i really made that film to force moro you know to become an activist but also you know, to extend his life because, you know, he's, he's my best friend. I mean, he's, he's uncle to my daughter and, and he's a family member. So, uh, you know, my, my brother didn't make it, you know, my brother in 2018, Perry, he took his own life. And, you know, I just, you know, there's nothing we could do for him, but I realized we could do so much for other people that are, you know, giving them the tools, giving them awareness and then socially, like giving people a platform to say, hey, you know, this is going on with me, too. And and here's what I'm doing about it. Or here's how you can help me. The response. I mean, we got tens of thousands of, of contacts from people that were like, this is this, this is my aunt. This is my cousin. This is, you know, I'm going to get help. People, you know, who saw the film and were like, I was going into the closet to take my life. And someone said, go watch this film. And I and now I'm here and this is what I want to do. So it was just super powerful. As you, you always hear, you always hear if you have a medium like that and you could even touch one life, you've made such a difference. And just having that multiple and something that's going to go on forever. I mean, that, that I had no idea your connection to that, which is pretty amazing because <laughs> I did watch yeah. it. So I, I, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Your, yeah. your brother. So when you get to, when you did find out your brother was, had this, it was too late in the game to change it or like, yeah. what was your outreach to it like it's, it's i want people to hear the story because it's for sure it's it's something where i think like you said it's, it's, it's very taboo like a people a lot of people still don't want to talk about it and the ones that do talk about it I mean, it's a lot of them don't under have a full understanding of the severity of it right i mean just you saying that he took his own life just i mean it brought chills to me so i just want to talk about that a bit if you're good with that 
Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today. With expert interviews, practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts for sure yeah um you know he was a vet he was in the navy and um he uh, lost a finger in the navy he was a cook and he used to keep his knives above the above the stove on a metal shelf and he got up one day with his wedding ring on to grab the knives and he slipped and fell and it degloved his finger. And so they discharged him, but he had built his whole life around being a Navy guy. And so, so he just, his, his identity was stuck there. Everything was, was there. And that was his, you know, that's what made him. And so when he came home, he just didn't know what to do. He, yeah. You know, he bounced around and he tried all different things, but he ended up uh, homeless and living on the streets for 10 years. And so over a course of 10 years, we, just kept trying to get him out. Um, and we didn't know enough about bipolar to understand, you know, we're like, Oh, he's, you know, he's, he's an alcoholic, he's a drug addict. You know, we didn't understand, you know, that there was another layer that, that we could help with. And, you know, we got him off the streets five, six times, but every time he would go back and every time he would go back to, you know, self-medicating and we just weren't able to save him basically. And by the time, you know, we, by the time we reached him and we're like, you have to stop, you know, you have to come home. It was just too late. And, you know, it just, it literally broke my heart and just destroyed our family. Cause you know, we were all, you know, waiting each day for him to show up again so we could save him. And then, you know, we get the call from the coroner and it's like, he's gone. And it was just so hard. Um, you know, the sad but, part is, is what happened to your brother is happening to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of vets every day. Now. Yeah. It's so and, crazy. It's so crazy when you hear stories and you talk to ex Marines or ex Navy SEALs that have friends or family and just, it's just, it's that it's the same story. It's just repeating itself. It's like, it's like consistently repeating itself, the same damn story where it's, do we blame that on the government? Do we blame it on there's not enough assistance? Do we blame it? Because you, you deal with somebody that obviously like your brother, that obviously routine was huge part of his, of his need almost. Having that routine every day probably kept them aligned. And then coming out, and I, you always hear, wh- why do guys be join biker gangs and all that for the brotherhood, for that routine, for that companionship? And it's it's so sad to hear that so many people put their lives at risk or served or put their time and, and hours and, 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 and years towards helping a cause. And then once they're, once they're discharged, it's just next who's next yeah. to sign up. It's just this constant, it's this constant rotating line, right? Which is so sad. Yeah. And you know what? I, and no one's really to blame. It's just socially, it's not understood yet. Yeah. And until people are, until people are willing to say, Hey man, I got, I got a severe mental illness and this is what it's all about. You know, people, we're just not there yet, but we're getting close. And, and that's why I work so hard in the mental health space. And, you know, I'm an ambassador for NAMI and and Fountain house, which has, you know, the, the best community care programs for the severely mentally ill in the world. And it's all about self-care and maximizing their value and, you know, allowing them to both heal and then participate because some people, you know, I I have a friend who's schizophrenic and that's, that's, that's that's a different ball game altogether, man. Yeah. And, and, but when you know it and then, then, you know, to recognize things like, Oh, you know what? That doesn't make sense. Like, Hey, Hey buddy. Okay. Like what's going on over there? You know, but even inside of families, they don't understand what's going on. And I was that guy. I didn't know what was going on with Perry. And I only found out at the end of his journey. And yeah. luckily for Moro, you know, the, the knowledge I acquired, I was able to put to use on him. And, you know, so it had tremendous value. But, you know, Moro being brave enough to make that film and 
you know, show it for what it is. You know, I've taken Moro out of many mental hospitals and, you know, got him back on his feet. And what's crazy is, is people that see him ringside and just on a, on a big screen or a TV would never know that. Never know. Never yeah. know that till that came out. It was just like, whoa, what's what's this about? Let me go we'll see this documentary. And it was like when you saw it, it was just like, wow. Yeah. It's, wow. It's a kick in the teeth, but that's what you, you know, want it. That's what we needed. That's what, yeah. that's what society yeah. needed. And you know, like I'm doing this vet basil thing right now, yeah. and it's all about, you know, well, it's about helping our family heal. Cause you know, we we still haven't healed from it. Yeah. And the only way to heal is to be with those people that are going through the same thing and find, you know, companionship and community and share it and find ways, um, you know, to to help heal one another. And, you know, art is the perfect media because it has such emotion and and so value. Are you, so are you physically doing those as well or are you just <laughs> yeah. promoting it? Well, I saw the artist. I was gonna say I I, I, I saw I saw you with it. I saw you with it. I was like, is he is he actually physically doing these yeah. these flags well, or I, just I will be making art okay at the at the uh, art session on uh December 2nd. And okay. that's part of my healing. Um, okay. and then I'm gonna give that art um to my family you know awesome. because awesome it's 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 a way for all of us to you know both acknowledge what happened and then to have a you know to have a step through healing yeah um you know for me martial arts was my way to heal you know it's connecting my mind my body my spirit and you know achieving you know my personal dreams yeah. um, but it was an art form you know i had to study i had to focus i had to you know have discipline and and you know it also forced me to find out how to fight and what worked and what didn't, which forced me to go talk to people and have friends and community. And, um, you that's know, a huge, that's that, a huge, that's a huge part of martial arts, the community, right? Right. The community yeah. was the biggest thing for me. Cause you know, I had a really tough childhood and I grew up on the streets and I grew up in institutions and let's, so let's talk my, about, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about yeah. your upbringing a bit. I mean, I, mean I, I think it's a huge part of, I guess your identity, right? I mean, uh, who took you in and, and just your upbringing and obviously with Ken and not one, not let's, let's talk about it a bit. Let's, let, where did you grow up and give me a little history, a short little history of your upbringing. Sure. Yeah. I was born in uh, Santa Monica, California. Yeah. And then I was raised in Northern California, which was at the time um, kind of North central. I was Redding and Anderson, California. Okay. Um, but you know, my dad left. I never, never saw my dad. Never knew who he was. Uh, my first, you know, so you're, stepdad. You're, you're, you were too young to realize it. Like, yeah, how old were you I, when he left? I think he left when I was maybe one or two. Oh, so yeah, I never, yeah, yeah. Like so I no never, memory. Yeah, yeah. There was zero memory of dad. I didn't even know that everyone else didn't have a dad until I started going to school. You know, and then yeah. you know there were dads there, and I was like, well, who are these guys? Because um, I just it when you grow up without, you don't know that it Different. exists. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, but, you know, as far as I remember, I had a good childhood. I don't, you know, I remember, I remember having a good childhood. Uh, and it changed when I turned about seven or eight. My mom got married and I got a dad for the first time, my stepdad, Joe. And he was a Marine who came back like many, broken, struggling. And his medication was alcohol. He self-medicated through alcohol. So, um, you know, and that seemed perfectly normal to me. Um, and what wasn't normal was, uh, my mom and my stepdad used to lock me in closets when I was a kid, when I was bad and which seemed perfectly normal at the time. Um, but emotionally it was just traumatizing for me. You know, it just really, you know, made me scared and frightened and just unsure, you know, as a, as a human being. Um, and I found ways to make myself feel better, you know, crime and drinking and, when I started drinking when I was, you know, eight years old and, you know, just, it progressed until I was um, 10. When I was 10 years old, I threw rocks at a train and in the state of California, that's a felony. And so I was taken from my home and I spent uh, 10 days in juvenile hall. And it was the very first time I'd ever been outside of my house, ever, ever spent the night somewhere, you know, ever participated in another community. And you're how old? 
I was I would I was eleven at the time. I you're went a, to Juvenile you're, Hall. Like I got a thirteen, so you're a baby still. Yeah, yeah. My daughter's thirteen. It's like I, yeah, I went to Juvenile Hall when I was eleven. Um, I talked to the other kids, you know, like, hey, how do you guys dealing with, you know, the locking in the closets and the living in the backyard and all the, the the weird things that were happening to me, and and these were the bad kids, right? The Juvenile Hall kids were telling me yeah that's not right like that's child oh, yeah. <laughs> like it's terrible and yeah. so for the first time i realized that um because everyone you know i was seeing all these shrinks and psychologists and all these people because of my problems my emotional issues all the things that were wrong with me um and when i got there and, and the guys told me that i was like wait a minute maybe there's something wrong with what's going on in my life and i went and saw my counselor and i said hey this is what's happening and i don't think she believed me because it seemed crazy you know, you don't live in the backyard. I was like, no, I live in a tool shed. Um, and, but she gave me some advice, which I'll never forget. She said, listen, if you keep doing stuff like this, they're going to take you from your home. And that was the message that I heard, not the other stuff. So I went home and committed as many crimes as I could until they came and took me from the home. So when I was 11, I became a ward of the state of California and they became my parents. And I started in you know group homes and foster homes and and you know working my way up um and the only you know i thought it was a game to be honest with you i thought i'd found the secret formula to surviving you know traumatic things so i'd go to a new home um that have new parents and a new brothers and sisters but if i didn't like it and i wasn't comfortable i always remembered what that counselor told me which is you know if you commit crimes they'll come take you and to me, it became a game. I just kept, if I didn't like it. I'd commit a crime. They'd take me, send me to a new home. And that worked great for a while until I'd done enough and gone through enough homes that they were sending me to work camps and lockdown camps and, you know, a harder incarceration. How old were you by then, roughly? 12 and a half. <laughs> that's crazy. That is honestly crazy. Yeah. But you think, you know, your brain's not formed well, when I, you're 12 I, years I, old. I, 100%. Yeah. I, 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 I'm I not saying on your part. I'm yeah. saying as, oh, yeah. as an adult thinking of a 12 and 11-year-old. Sure. Yeah. It just, it's yeah. just like, how do you not? This is crazy. That's just, yeah. yeah. It's mind-boggling. But, you know, here's the, the thing is, is my mom suffers from mental health issues. And, no, you know, she's never talked about it. Um, you know, my stepdad, you know, had... PTSD and trauma from the war. He never talked about it. They all just bottled it up. And then through their parenting and through their actions, you know, it was passed down to me. Um, and I didn't know any of it. I was just trying to be a kid and trying to fit in, you know, like kids do. Yeah. Uh, but when I was t- almost 13, I met uh, Bob Shamrock. Yeah. And the Shamrock Boys Ranch was legendary in the uh, juvenile hall system. It was like where the tough kids went, you know, it was like, the end of the line, just before you went to youth prison, you stopped there. Um, and, it, and, you know, it was, it was kind of terrifying, to be honest with you. You know, the way it was portrayed, I was like, oh, man, that's the place you do not want to go. But then when I met Bob Shamrock, he was the nicest guy. And he was just, you know, totally straightforward and sweet and like, you know, say it like it is. And so I sat down. You know, he came to interview me. I sat down. I went to tell him my story, my sob story. And he's like, no. He's like, nope, you can stop there. He's like, we don't do games. We don't tell lies. It's not about bullshit. He's like, it's about being a man. And he's the first guy to ever man talk me. And it just made all the difference. Like, it just, my brain instantly went, okay, I've been doing this wrong. You know, there's there's other ways out there. And this guy's got those ways. Um and so we left the interview and I was like, oh man, there's no way he's going to take me. I'm, I'm a total, you know, screw up. Like, I think by then I already had three felonies. So, you know, I, I just figured, oh, they'll send me to the next place and I'll keep doing what I'm doing. But he did take me and, you know, picked me up, you know, a month later, drove me to his ranch and it was the family I was looking for. You know, he had 20 kids. We were all brothers and he ran it like a family. Like it was just like, you know, like a regular family. We had chores, we had responsibilities. If you did good, you were rewarded. If you did bad, you were punished. Like there wasn't anything crazy. There wasn't anything that didn't make sense. Um, and I just fell in love with him. You know, it was, it was the first time 
that a man had stepped up and been a father to I was me. say I'd be a father figure. Yeah. Is, that yeah. was it. He was just, you know, he 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 was a dad. And it, that's what I needed. I love that you said that because you anybody could be a father and not many men could be a dad. Yeah. So he I was love my that. dad. I love that you said that. Yeah. How, it, how oh sorry, sorry, continue. Well, I was gonna say it 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 just opened up a whole new world for me. And he was in, you know, he was like you know, these are the rules. This is how it works. Um, and you guys are boys and you're going to have lots of energy. So we play sports and we work out and we make ourselves strong. That's what men are. And I was like, okay. So when I was 13, I started lifting weights. Like, I, you know, and he encouraged it and he, you know, got us weights and, and it was how you did that. Uh, and yeah, I lifted weights for 25 straight years because of that without, without fail. Yeah. You know, it just changed who I was. Um, and I tried my best there, you know, unfortunately I still had emotional problems. I still, you know, did drugs. I still got in trouble and eventually I would get taken out of that. And, um, I actually stole a car. I was just telling the story to our guest here. <laughs> I was walking by a car one night. I'd been drinking with my friends, cars running. It's cold outside. And I go, Oh, well, I'll just hop in here and drive myself home. <laughs> how, how, old, how, how old are you? Uh, it's probably maybe 15 by then and i jumped in and you know of course the guy called right away because he was warming up his car for work yeah and you know the cops pulled me over and i was arrested uh, but the result of that was they took me out of the boys ranch they thought well this is not enough supervision if he's able to do these things you know he needs to go to higher security and i was taken away from bob and you know he fought for me and did everything he could but this state with my parents, you know, and they were able to make the final decision. And so I left there and I realized I had screwed up and I realized that that's re where I really truly wanted to be. And so I went, you know, I went to work camp and I went to different places and I worked as hard as I could to get back to, you know, Susanville is where we lived at the time where the boys ranch was. Yeah. And eventually I got back. And when I got back, um, you know, I got my girlfriend pregnant before I left. So when I was 16, a little over 16, I had my son, little Frank. And when how, how, so back, how old how old's little Frank now? Little Frank turned 33 wow. on November the 28th. We just celebrated his birthday. He just got married and he's a grown man. Right you at, th you think yeah. at 33? At the time, uh, he yeah. was a little baby and I was a punk kid trying to get my life together. Um, I still remembered the principles and the things that Bob taught me. I still worked out. You know, I still. When, was, when, when was your intro into martial arts at that point? Uh, it wasn't until I got out of prison. How old are yeah. you when you first started? Uh, twen uh, I would have been 22, almost 22. So you only started at 22. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, happened, so when I went back to Susanville. I, I worked three jobs. I went to high school. I had a wife. I had a son. And that carried on for a little while until her family came and took her one day because my reputation around town, you know, I was on the front page of our small town's newspaper when I got in trouble because I'd been in so much trouble. So rightfully so, her family came and took her one day and my son from the house I'd rented, from all the stuff I'd provided. And you know, that was my goal was to be a dad. Like my goal was to be a father because I didn't have one. And yeah. I saw what a dad could do. I saw what, you know, I saw the value. And, and so that was my whole goal. And when that was taken away, I just, I just fell apart. And I went, I mean, you know, talk about commitment. You know, I really, you know, tripled down on my commitment to crime. And what happened was <laughs> 20 felonies later, I was caught. And they sent me to youth prison for six years. And that was when I was 18. So when I was 21, I got out. But during prison, Bob never left. He wrote me letters. He came in and visited. He sent me stuff. He continued to mentor and guide me, even though I'd screwed everything up, even though I was in prison. And so I took his advice every day in prison. I, I worked in the kitchen so I could have extra food. I lifted weights every single day. I studied bodybuilding. I went to college. Like I really tried to do everything humanly possible to get myself back 
you know, to have some value in society and to be a dad. Uh, and then, you know, when I was in Folsom, which was my last couple of years, he came to me and he said, Hey, this brand new sport is starting. It's called at the time it was called, it was called no holds barred. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> brand new sport is starting and, and you'd be great at it. And your brother's doing it. And, and, you know, he really pitched me on it. He said it was, uh, kind of like professional wrestling, but tougher. And yeah. I was like, oh, I love professional wrestling. I could totally do that. <laughs> a little, I'd never seen a, a, a little, a little yeah. different, a little, a little different. <laughs> I'd never seen it. I'd never seen it on TV. Like I didn't even know what was happening, but yeah. you know, he presented it. I always trusted and believed him. I believed in his mentorship. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll yes. And, and so I paroled uh, April 4th of 1994 from Folsom prison and Bob picked me up. And, um, two days later, he drove me down to the martial arts studio, the dojo, yeah. uh, which at the time was lion's den with my brother, Ken. Yeah. Um, and he dropped me off and gave me the most dadly advice you could ever give somebody, which is never give up and don't show them you're scared. And that was it. I walked in and Ken beat the hell out of me. And then what, what's the um, age? What's the age difference from you and Ken? Nine years. So he was nine years old. That's a big gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he'd already played college football and you yeah. know went to the Olympic trials for wrestling. Like he was a monster, and yeah. I was like a you know I was kind of a nerdy kid, um, but I had good genetics. Like I was you know I packed on you know twenty twenty five pounds of muscle from all this lifting and eating yeah. and focusing and. So when I got out of prison, I was about 190 pounds, just solid muscle, you know, no drugs, no nothing, just pure, you know, good muscle. And, um, and then, you know, it took me about two and a half weeks to heal up from the beating because he can beat me. You know, he, he didn't want me there. You know, I was a punk kid straight from prison and he was going to, you know, beat me into submission. So I would quit, but, you know, I took my dad's advice and, you know, I didn't even know you could tap during the tryout. Ken's like turning my knee backwards <laughs> and I'm going, ah, like just literally screaming because he's tearing my knee tendons out. <laughs> and out of the, out of my ear, I hear Jason Delucia go, Hey, um, did anybody tell him he could tap? And there's like this, I hear this conversation going on. They're like, tap, no, no, no. no. So I just start screaming, tap, tap. I didn't even know what tapping meant. That's how, that's how unknowledgeable about all of it I was. <laughs> but when I healed up, you know, I, I, as I say, I picked up the sword. I was like, this is going to be my life. You know, this is, it was always my dream to be a champion. It was always my dream to be a leader. And this was my chance. And I knew nothing about fighting and I've been in prison fights, been in street fights, but nothing prepares you for being a professional fighter. Yeah. yeah. You know, at the time the sport was so misunderstood, like very misunderstood and still Nobody. very, I mean, yeah. yeah, you 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 came in right before the explosion, yeah. right? And nobody knew anything, and uh, you know, it was a blessing and a curse. You know, I I came from a new world. Like, you know, you don't know something, you ask. Well, the old world was you don't ask anything; you just yeah. do what you're told. And so yeah. I was, you know, I was the guy. I was like, well, "What about this?" And they'd be like, "All right, come over here." And they would beat me. Because you don't ask questions. Uh, but what they didn't know was uh, each and every time I was getting stronger and I was learning. And I quickly surpassed, you know, people I was training with and the people that were actually teaching me. I, you know, because I had the same, you know, mindset as when I was in prison. Like, write it down, understand it, learn it, study the human body, like figure it out and ask questions. And nobody wanted to ask a question and get beaten and nobody wanted to feel like they didn't know, you know, cause it was a tough guy culture. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it was, it, it helped me learn really quick. I took a lot of beating. How, 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 how quickly did you get into your first, um, your first cage fight? I turned pro in eight months. Did you, did you do any amateur fights or just write the pro? Nope. No the amateur pro. fights. I, uh, I got the invitation after six months of training to go to Japan yeah, and to have my first match in Pancrase in Japan. Yeah. And so, um, you're still on parole. So I had to get, uh, I had to get <laughs> my parole officer's permission to go to Japan, which, you know, yeah. is near impossible. 
But at the time, uh, you know, I also studied law and I studied everything I could when I was in prison. And I knew that if there was um, viable employment anywhere in the world that didn't exist where I lived, that they couldn't deny me because it would be a disadvantage. I love the and loophole. So I, nice little yeah, loophole. Yeah, so I went in, I gave him the pitch and he's like, oh, you're going to need a letter and this and that. I came back with the letter and he's like, I can't believe we're doing this, but you get to go to Japan. So I went to Japan <laughs> and I um, finished my training there. Uh, on December 18th of 1994, I had my very first professional match. Who was your first opponent? Boss Rudin. It was, it was. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the, one, one, of the, one of the guys in my office here for Kamoro is, uh, uh, I would call him an MMA nerd, and, and he was actually talking about that. So how many fights did you um, have in Pancreas before you moved to the UFC? Um, 18 or somewhere around there. Yeah. So when you got to the UFC and, and obviously you, you dominated there and became champ and, and, and dominated there as a champ and retired, what was your mindset when you retired as a champ and just left it, let it go like that? Well, from, from the UFC, you know, one of the things that, you know, first off, the, the Japanese were way ahead of everybody at the time. Oh, what, so, all what all like, question? What all question? Way ahead. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I would travel you know, lear through learning and teaching, I, I, I realized that, you know, when you teach, you have to know something really good. Yeah. Like there's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, yeah. a bridge to like psyche where you really have to own it. And then you also learn better through te teaching. So yeah. I started teaching, you know, after three, four months of training. Cause I'd write. Yeah. And I would absorb it all. I'd ask questions. Questions, I'd get beaten and I would have, you know, things that would see that. And so they would ask me and I, oh, let me show you. But every time I showed them, you know, I was both reinforcing the knowledge, learning it better, yeah. finding out more about it, finding out how other bodies use it. And it just made sense to me. So I traveled the world teaching and I could tell, I mean, I would go into a dojo and like destroy 300 people <laughs> without breaking a sweat just because my knowledge was so great and my condition was so good and then other people just didn't they didn't have the knowledge and and that's how i got so good you know as i was always teaching i was always learning and then i was always applying it. and whatever worked we kept whatever didn't work i was like that doesn't work you know we have to get we have to get rid of that um and then one of the things i tell people like because i do a lot of corporate leadership and they're like well how'd you get in this position and i'm like well it's the same as martial arts uh, you know, I would ask the question and I could tell from being on the streets when they weren't being truthful or they didn't know the real answer. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'd be like, Hey, what about this? And they'd be like, Oh, well, oh. and I'd be like, okay, well, what about this biomechanic? And, and I would see, they would just be like, they don't understand what I was talking about. So they would make something up or they would just beat me up to sort of get through the moment yeah. <laughs> and that survival you know, mechanism of being able to tell and read people from being on the streets became very, very valuable because I knew there was yeah. only one guy in 16 years that had said, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, huh? He said, I don't know. Let's, let's, let's work on that. Like literally everyone else was like, all right, well, let me show you, uh, you know, yeah. they just, because no one wanted to be weak or not know or, we call it the master's syndrome. Yeah. Everyone wants yeah. to be a master, but no one has mastered it. So, yeah. but that one, that one tool of, of learning how to read people and being honest with people was super valuable in my learning process. And it's something I recommend to everybody. Like, oh, it, doesn't matter. Always, it doesn't matter what field, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't for matter. I always say the day you stop learning is the day you die. Yeah, all true. And it doesn't and matter what it is, right? <laughs> yeah, especially in cage fighting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get back to that. So the, the UFC, when you when you left UFC, I mean, and why I'm talking, I'm going to talk about this is because uh, oh, Dan, the gentleman here that works here, he said, and it's something that we were talking about, um, the Hall of Fame. That's something that, um, of all people, you should be in the UFC Hall of Fame. Zero questions on that, right? So where's your mindset with that? I mean, I don't, I don't really care because that's not part of my life anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, for me, it was like a journey for myself. I had little to do with that. Yeah. You know, um, 
you know, after I got into the UFC, I, I quickly realized like, there's nobody here that could touch me. Like it was, yeah. I mean, it was, it was comical because I was so far ahead of everybody. And so what I really started to do was, you know, look past the sport, you know, I could see we were at a certain stage of growth. It wasn't getting any bigger. I was hired as the first spokesman for the UFC because when we were kicked off cable, like my job was to go around and figure out how do we get back on cable? What, what, what do you, what do, what do the cable companies need? So for the first time I put on a suit and I was telling my story to cable executives because we were trying to get our audience back. Yeah. And so that's what developed my spokesman skills and all, you know, these presentation skills. But at the time, you know, I was running the numbers. I was like, listen, this, this sport's dying. It's incredibly dangerous. I'm, you know, 10 yards ahead of everybody else. And so I started pursuing what, you know, my larger dreams were. And that was to be an actor and an action hero and to sort of, you know, move into that phase of life. And I, um, I found a mentor, as I always do. You know, I searched for somebody who had guided what I was trying to do. And when I sat down with him, his name is Henry Holmes. He's still my mentor to this day and my father figure. Yeah. And when I sat down with him and I told him my story, first he loved it because he's a fighter. And, and, um, and then he said, listen, this contract that you're under is one of the most restrictive contracts that exists. No entertainment, sports, or other contracts are patterned like this. This is a complete ownership of everything you ever create. You're like an unsung employee that can be cut at any moment for anything. And you have zero rights, leverage, or opportunity in this contract. And I was like, well, that's not good. What do I do? And so he told me, you know, what we should do is you should sign a multi-fight contract. But let me put in this one thing that if you ever publicly retire and renounce your championship, the rest of the contract is null and void. And so that's why when I fought Tito and I cleaned out the entire middleweight division, I stood up and I gave the belt back and I publicly retired because that allowed me to become a free agent. And I was the first free agent in mixed martial arts. And that's what allowed me to start my own league and do all yeah. these other things that eventually, you know, gave me the value and, you know, the opportunity in my life that I'm living today. Was well, because where, where did you meet Scott Coker? Coker. I met Scott Coker through Ernie Reyes uh, martial arts. Uh, Ernie had hired me. Ernie's a legend and a master of martial arts and yeah, yeah. Uh, Taekwondo expert. And just yeah. as a martial artist is, is one of the, is one of the pillars of what I think real martial arts is. And oh, so it's he, funny because we were just talking about him. I had on yeah. a gentleman that I've known for, I've known for years and I, and I just, the other day, I was like, I got to have you on my podcast, uh, Ron Van Cleef. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And uh, sure. I had him on and, and, and that can, his, his name actually came up in the conversation and Ron's yeah. Ron, Ron is, is also like a legend. The guy's, the guy's 85 and trying to get a black belt, the Gracie black belt. He's living <laughs> in Hawaii. He just got his purple belt and he's, and he says his goal is to have it before he turns 90 is black belt and he still competes. He just had a competition at 90. <laughs> It's crazy. So awesome. 85, whatever. It's, the guy loves martial arts. It's crazy. Yeah. I love those guys. Like Danny and Asano, just those guys to me are what true martial artists are about. You know, they live it, they breathe it. It's, yeah. it's, it's the fabric of all things. And, and so I met, uh, so Ernie had me teach for him because he's, you know, I, we were both in San Jose, you know, he saw what I was doing. He saw how I, you know, represented myself. And so he had me teach for him one day. And that's when I met Scott. Scott was a black belt under Ernie Reyes. I didn't um, even know that about Scott. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. He was, huh? Yes, yes. See, yes. I, I wouldn't even think he was into martial arts. I thought he was just the exact business guy with the suit on. Because I met Scott. Um, I was... Uh, when Verdum beat Fedor, Strike oh, Force, yeah. yep. I was there in San Jose with Verdum. At that time, I, I was buddies with Verdum, and, and I was up there at the hotel, and Scott was in the hotel, and I was talking to him, and I was like, you got to bring this to Canada, Strike Force. I had no idea that you were a partner with him, so that's another yep. story altogether. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I remember talking to Scott. We had a conversation on the couch. I remember the hotel lobby. We were having a conversation with him. And, uh, yeah, you would never – I would never – I thought he was just a businessman. I had no idea he had a martial art background. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And his dream was to be a promoter. Like that was his yeah. thing. So, yeah. you know, that's what he liked. Um, 
And so I met him there training with Ernie. And then he started promoting kickboxing in San Jose under the Strike Force band. Yeah. And I started, uh, you yeah, know, I was a big star in San Jose. And so I started supporting him and helping him, you know, going to his events. Um, we did all kinds of stuff. I would do demos because people had never seen what I was doing. You know, it was so new and different. So I would do like demos at his events and I'd bring my team out and, and so created this great, you know, relationship, this kind of trust relationship. Uh, he started doing business with K1, K1 yeah, America, yeah, yeah, and yeah. kickboxing. And, um, and so we started doing business there. And just over the course of years, we just kept, you know, doing business together because it was good business. And, you know, we both had the same principles, you know, honor, respect, discipline, martial arts principles. Yeah. Um, and then one day uh, in the midst of my a, many retirements, he sat me down. He's like, hey, I really want to get into mixed martial arts. And I tried to talk him out of it. I said, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pricey. It's, you know, it's, there's, there's the competition and, and he's like, well, how much does it cost? <laughs> so I gave him a number and, and uh, he said, well, give me some time. Let me work on that. Um, and he came back with a, with a big check and our partnership began. And that's how Strike Force started. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's pretty, uh, yeah. I had no idea about the history of that. I mean, it's Strike Force was running strong. It's, it's such a hard, it's such a hard con- like industry to be in. Oh yeah. Very, very, very hard industry to be in, right? I mean, just for the TV rights, TV deals, I and mean, obviously UFC is doing well now, but they're they've turned into more into entertainment, like uh, more of a like a Hollywood production in a way, right? And the amount of events they're doing now, it's crazy. It's like every week's at an event. Every week there's an event, right? Where's your connection now with with martial arts? Do you guys still have a connection? Do you do anything in, in the field still? Well, I still teach martial arts you do not but not in the setting you would think so i teach a uh bare knuckle boxing program as part of my leadership course which is called warrior's code i teach that to corporate executives i love it and i use the medium of bare knuckle boxing to bring high level experience teams together so they function better and to um uh help leaders um become better leaders that's kind of kind of the thing but the medium of bare knuckle boxing is one of the most intimate <laughs> that's that, that, i mean when, when you're dealing with corporate i mean that's fight club right yeah it is but yeah. the, but if you look at like the mechanics of it yeah you know it really you can't just throw any punch you no. break your hand yeah. and so every, everything has to be well thought and and well timed and well structured and um, and then if you're going to practice that with another person, there has to be clear communication yeah. and uh, awareness and connectivity. And so, you know, the fundamentals of martial arts principles inside of bare knuckle boxing are yeah. perfectly applicable to leadership because a terrible leader is going to throw a, a bad punch, break his hand, and then he can't lead no more. <laughs> and so it's, it's a really interesting program i actually created it uh, for google i got hired uh, to do leadership for the uh, google g tech team which at the time uh, managed all of the hardware inside of google and um and these guys were 25 years plus executives and they were all under new management on a new team trying to reach incredible goals and so they're like we need something that's you know, never been done before. So I wrote this entire program just for them to help with leadership. And then since then, it's, it's just totally taken off. Now we use it in all kinds of different fields. Um, But it is martial arts. And then when I do um, leadership coaching, like one on one leadership coaching, or um, a lot of my clients, like one of my clients wants to leave Google after, you know, 30 years in tech. Yeah. And they want to bridge to a new industry and do new things. And, and so I'm guiding them to do that. And it's all martial arts principles. I love it. 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 So you're, you said your daughter's 13 now. Yep. Do you, have, any, going do you, on do you have your 30, 30 year old son? Do you have any other children? <laughs> nope. Nope. What Just does the two. fatherhood mean to you now compared to what it meant to you then? Like, how does your perspective, your mindset, because now obviously you have a lot more time, a lot more patience. Um, you're in a different 
level, obviously now, career, everything. So what does fatherhood mean to you now? Well, for me, it's, it's, it's everything. Like, I don't, I don't know what else to do. Yeah. Like I don't, and there's nothing else I want to do. Um, and, you know, if you look back, total strangers stepped in to mentor me and help me and guide me, you know, from Henry Holmes to, to, you know, Bob Shamrock, they, you know, they saw a need yeah. and they stopped and gave me wisdom and guidance and love. And that to me is what a father does. Like that's what, that's what it's all about. And so, you know, to me, it's every day. Like it's, it's the, you know, there's work, but you know, fatherhood comes first, you know, (laughs) everything comes second after being a dad for me. Um, In fact that, you know, when, um, you know, when Bjorn left Bellator, they, they called me to run it. And like, hey, we want you to, you know, Scott's doing it now. Scott Coker's running it now. Yeah. They called me and the president of Spike TV sat me down and gave me the whole pitch. And I said, well, he said, yeah, you're going to travel. You're going to do this. And I said, I, you know, I, I can't do that. He's like, well, what do you, what do you mean? I says, well, you know, we have singing lessons. We got, <laughs> Love it. Love we, got, it. we got this going it. on. We got that. I was like, I don't, I don't want to miss those things because I missed them the first time, yeah. you know, because I was doing. I was becoming a champion. I was like, I don't, I don't need or want to do that now. Now I want to be a dad. Like this is my role. Um, and I think they thought I was crazy. Um, but the other thing I can say is, you know, I had a boy and I love my son. Like I'm so proud of him and I'm so full of love having him in my life. But when a man has a little girl, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, my friends had told me and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Kids are kids are kids. But, you know, she, my daughter came along when I was mature enough to appreciate yeah. the role of a dad to a daughter and to really lean into that. I mean, I did hair, I did makeup, like I did everything yeah. because it didn't, it, because she wanted it and it made yeah. her happy. And I didn't care what anyone thought. Like to yeah. me, you know, I was like, well, sure, I'll learn how to braid hair. You know, let me, let me get in there. Yeah. Um, because to see her joy and her happiness and to, you know, watch her tell people, oh, my dad did my hair and they look at me all crazy. Um, it's just so much, you know, love and caring in that. Um, and she really touched my heart. Like, like girls and dads is a very special bond there that, you know, and, and you realize as you mature, every man she ever comes across when she looks for, what's important to her in life she models after her dad like that's what she's looking for so i'm like oh man this is no no pressure no pressure this is something i could undertake here (laughs) but it's a good pressure it's it's i I love it no i I, I, everything you say i I got a smile like yeah (laughs) one thing about me is um another part of uh, one of the businesses i run is i actually coach entrepreneur i I coached entrepreneurial dads i actually have a book number one selling book entrepreneur called entrepreneurial dad no way. I love yeah. it. So um, I call it my non-negotiables. So I put into my schedule and I try to live by it as much as I can. I call it a three to seven every single day from three to seven. That's my time to sit down. We try to have dinner every single day for over 12 years. We try to have dinner every single night as a family. Um, that's my time to take my son to baseball, my daughter to dance. Like that's my family time. That's non-negotiable. That's first thing in my schedule every single month and everything else works around it. So I, I love that you're saying that because it, that's me. That's me to a T, right? Everything you're saying right now. So I, I love that. And it just, it, it puts, I, I got everything you're talking. I have a smile from ear to ear because I'm, I'm loving hearing everything you're saying. You're passionate with it, right? It is. It's so precious because there's so many stats people don't even realize. And there's like stats where it says 90% of the face time we have with our kids is before the age of 18. And you don't think of that stuff, right? Time flies by. Like your daughter's 13. I guarantee you could look at her and be like, oh my God, I remember when you were one years old, right? It, oh, it, the yeah. time flies by and it's so important to build these memories now, build these memory box. I, I always tell people even stuff like take a shitload of pictures and develop pictures. We, our house, we develop all our pictures. When we go on a trip, we go anywhere, we develop our pictures. My wife slaps into an album. And you know how many times I, on a Sunday night, I'll go upstairs. My kids are sitting on the, on the floor in their bedroom, going through old photos and laughing. Yep. And it's so precious to have those pictures. Like I just recently lost my dad, which was, he was like my best mm-hmm. friend. Right. And 
now being able to sit back and look at pictures when we were young and talk about those memories is so precious. And being able to even tell my kids about certain memories of things I did when I was small, it's easy to tell a story. But when you could actually reflect with a picture and show that picture in that moment, it just brings that story to life. So I always tell people, develop pictures, uh, build memories. These are all things because life life changes in seconds. You, every time yeah. you walk outside and get in the car, you don't know what the hell is going to happen, right? And you want to be able to build as many memories and 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 document those memories because man you, you want to be able to your children to tell their children and their grandchildren everything about you and their times together so yeah i love everything you're saying because all those things are just so precious simple things like combing your hair and, and taking your shopping i i do something with my kids i call it i call it uh we have six birthdays a year and every two months i'll take them out one day and the pandemic changed everything last year, but we were back onto a schedule, but every two months I'll take one of my kids. And, and what I try to do is, is it, I'll pull them from school and just me and them. And that's their day. And if my daughter wants to go do her nails, I'll go do her nails. You want to go have lunch? Let's go have lunch. And that's her day. And it's just, it's just time. It's nothing to do with financials, not buying presents. It's just time. And you build it and they start looking forward to those dates because they know they're on their calendar and say, hey, I'm, I'm, and that's, and I separate them. So they have their own memories. It's not together. And in simple, simple things like that, that people don't take the time because they are so focused on their career. So focused on building, man, money, money is money shit, man. Money comes and goes, man. If you're a good entrepreneur, you'll make money. I mean, that's that beside the point is building the memories and, 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 and surrounding yourself with the right people. Is so, so important. Yeah, definitely the right people. Yeah, I could not have done anything without mentorship and people guiding me. And, yeah. and, and then, you know, like I, one of the things that I've really clung to since my, my career has ended, because I just realized the value in it is the super plus equals minus system. Yeah. To me, you know, he had done this, he, he had you know, taken stars, you know, champions and, you know, guided them. And, um, and so I'm always looking for that plus anytime I, I try to accomplish something. Yeah. Uh, and then what Marshall. Where, you know, whatever they're doing, you know, there, there's so much value because they're on the same journey. They know yeah. like they're having a similar experience and, and they have something to share and, you know, my, when I first started, you know, I used to, you know, want to beat those guys up and, you know, take their stuff and, you know, they were my equals. So they were a threat to me. And as I matured, I realized, you know, we're in this together and there's so much yeah. more value in collaboration and connection and, and, you know, using our resources uh, together. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and I've been a minus many times and I love that role. Because the person who's the student or the person who doesn't have the information or the person that has need, you know, there's always somebody that can benefit from your knowledge. And there's always somebody looking, but doesn't, you know, either have the courage or the opportunity or the location to sort of ask. Yeah. Um, and anytime I get new knowledge or information, I plug it into the plus equal minus system. Like when Henry tells me something, you know, about licensing or sports or whatever, you know, I take it back to my you know, colleagues. And I'm like, Oh man, like check this out. Um, yeah. And then I take it to my mentees and I'm like, listen, this is, you know, this is what has worked and this is the result of that. And, and what I find is, you know, having that, those, those three people, it just makes anything possible. Like it's yeah. because, you know, you become the teacher, you become the student, you become the competitor yeah. and it always keeps you active. There's never a time where like, Oh yeah, this is, great it's, you know i'm never bored with stuff yeah. because i'm always you know challenging myself and, and meeting people and connecting and and then passing it along to somebody yeah it's so important uh, that you always network is networking is such a powerful tool man oh, such yeah. a powerful tool because you never know who you're going to meet and and who 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 are you going to along the journey like you said help or who's going to help you there's always that that back and forth right so i, I love that part how old are you right now, Frank? I'm 48, but I'll be 49 in a couple of days. December 8th. You look, you look good for your age, buddy. You're keeping, you're keeping young, buddy. <laughs> I'll preserve. That's one thing about prison <laughs> is it preserves you nicely. And then if you live a comfortable life and eat well. <laughs> Cut off there. Still there? 
Hold on. I'm going to move closer to my router. Yeah. Oh, shit. Hold on. I got, I got Bill trying to get in here. Are you done? A couple more minutes. <laughs> Hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hold on. There we go. I'm supposed to be hiding out here in uh, Miami, but people have found out I'm here. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Back. There we go. There you go. There we go. A couple more minutes. You're being very precious with your time. You're being amazing. Uh, question. If something were to happen to you today, in a few words, how would you want to be remembered, described by your loved ones? Hmm. Um, as a good dad. Um, you know, as somebody who tried his best and cared for others, that's pretty much it. Now, your leadership business, uh, how long have you been running that now for? Uh, about three years, three years in total. What, what, what first got you into that, in that corporate world? Because I know what you said, it has a lot uh, yeah. to do with the, the martial arts and it's very similar. The, yeah. You focus on the discipline and all that, but what got you into that? Because that's, it's, it's, I, I love that you're saying it because you hear a lot of people trying to get into public speaking and all that. There's no money in that. If you're going to do anything, yeah. it's going to, it has to be the leadership in the corporate world. That's where the money is. And that's where you roll the business. And, and if you could carve your niche in there, it, it could be a very, very good career because um, your doors open up with a lot of networking and doing, right? So what got you into that? And what, what was your mindset with that when you first got into that? I mean, it really was a call from my friend, Anne, who worked yeah. on that G-Tech team. Yeah. And, you know, she, she was in that group with the very experienced team and a not so experienced leader. Yeah. And, you know, she, you know, with all her experience was like, man, we need something that you know, like we got to shake up this, this group. Um, and here's the Ann story. I used to have a Palm phone and one day my phone broke. I yeah. lived in Silicon Valley. So I um, look up Palm. I drive down to the Palm offices um, thinking it's a Palm store. Yeah. It's the corporate offices unbeknownst to me. I yeah. march in there. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, I got a broken phone. They're like, yeah, we don't, we don't, do that here <laughs> i'm like yeah but i'm a palm customer yeah. and i have a palm phone and the lady's trying to explain to me like no we're we're the corporate offices i said well i'm a customer so she calls upstairs and she's like hey some some guy's down here he won't leave and he's got a phone <laughs> and they're like well what's his name and she says uh what's your name sir i go frank shamrock so ann who yeah. i'd met at the time she goes, Frank Shamrock, do you know who that is? So she grabs a bunch of phones, comes down and politely tells me, listen, we, we don't do that here, but here's the phone. And I, I was like, well, thank you. I was like, that's really nice of you. So it just, I thought it was so kind of her to, you know, do that, that yeah. we became friends. And we had, a, <laughs> you know, friends for 12 years until I, and, you know, she gets married, you know, we end up being really close and just she uh, becomes a part of the family. And then one day I get a call from her and she's like, listen, our team is having a real hard time. You know, can you help us? And I'm like, yeah, you know, unbeknownst to me, she always admired me because every time I, everything I told her I was going to do, I just went and did it. Yeah. And she always thought that was really cool. And she always found, you know, a lot of encouragement in that, in her own work, you know, I was influencing her and I didn't even know it. Yeah. So, you know, she said, well, she told her boss, well, if there's one guy I know that can solve anything and, you know, find out a way. And so I'd get on the phone with uh, her boss and uh, he's like, well, what are you going to do that's different from all the other leadership stuff out there? And I thought to myself, what is the most intimate thing I can teach martial arts based that would inspire these people? And I went, ah, bare knuckle boxing. I'm going to teach you and we're going to use the medium of bare knuckle boxing. And there's this long silence. He just goes, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and so four months later, I was on a plane to Hong Kong and teaching their team. 
And in that four months, I, of course, researched the entire culture, wrote an yeah. entire curriculum, you know, created an entire process and business for the entire thing. And then um, when I did it, you know, the feedback and the, 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 the impact and the results were just phenomenal. So yeah. I, you know, it, it became a business from that moment on. Love it. I love it. I love it. Anything you want to leave our audience with? Um, yeah, well, I, you know, I'm in Florida right now for the Vet Basel event and it's during Art Basel Miami, which I didn't know anything about one month ago, but it turns out it's one of the largest, <laughs> most attended art shows in the world. Yeah. Um, and we're using the opportunity to support veterans. You know, my brother Perry was in the Navy and we're, we've been looking for a way for our family to heal. And we know there's a lot of veterans out there and veterans family that have, that have lost loved ones. And I've met a lot of them. And, you know, our systems like they're set up right now, they're not set up to comfort and support, unite and help heal these veterans. And we wanted to create an event that does that. And that's what our Vet Basil event is all about. Um, we're creating custom flags with military families, with veterans. And then we're gifting those back to veterans families, Gold Star families, so lost, lost loved ones. And we're creating, um, a circle of healing and a community of support. And that's what's needed right now for our veterans. So I'm just super proud to be supporting it. Um, our family, you know, it's helping us heal and we know it's gonna help a lot of other people heal. Miami's our first city. We're gonna do every city and we're gonna help a lot of people. I love it, I love it. This has been honestly, what a great conversation. When you're coming into a conversation, you never know who you're gonna meet or I've done, <laughs> I've been a guest on 94 podcasts in the last year and a bit. And I've also hosted on the Jeff Knows Inc. podcast. This one, I've hosted 161, 162 shows. And you never know the outcome until you go through the process, right? And man, you're, you're, you're just a good dude, man. You're just, you can just tell how genuine you are. So I, I appreciate this, man. I, I, I hope we can continue our connection going forward. And uh, thank you so much for coming on, brother. My pleasure. I've totally enjoyed it. Thank you, man. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Frank Shamrock, for taking time as busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nozine podcast. What a great conversation. If you guys enjoy this as much as I have, like always, tell your friends, tell your family, help spread the word, leave a review. Five stars would be absolutely amazing. Myself, my team love spending time reading the reviews. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward. Keep moving forward.